question, are Mormons more inclined, to, and, and you know, apologies to President Nelson, I'm going to use the term today. <laughs> Are Mormons more inclined than others towards sci-fi or speculative fiction? Uh, if so, why? Is it baked into our DNA? And just to uh, kind of emphasize that Short point answer. a little yes. bit, Thank you for <laughs> what I want to do is show you, you this know. little ad. So maybe we should introduce ourselves while it yeah, loads? Yeah, go ahead and be doing that while this is. not that Windows update? You go, Scott. <laughs> oh, hi. My name's Scott Park, and I've been involved with uh, Mormon literature for about 20 years now. Uh, and I've been writing science fiction for about 35. So uh, I'm an interesting crossover there because I've worked on both ends of it, the creative and the uh, academic study. Uh, my name is Daniel Friend. I am a science fiction editor. I came here to BYU to study editing, and I've always wanted to do science fiction, and now I get to. Um, I've got my cards up here if you're interested in my editing services. I'm also right on the side a little bit, and I'm published in this lovely little Trace the Stars anthology we'll be having soon. Excellent. And uh, so is Eric. <laughs> Thank you. As, as the heavenly choir begins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now for Eric. Oh. Okay. Uh, I'm Eric James Stone. Uh, I've had a bunch of short fiction published uh, and one novel by Bain. Um, I won a Nebula Award uh, a few years ago and was nominated for the Hugo Award for uh, a story called That Leviathan Whom Thou Hast Made, in which the, the protagonist is an LDS uh, branch president on a station inside the sun. Um, and uh, um, so, uh, you know, I've been a science fiction fan since I was a kid, and uh, now I write it. Cool. Uh, my name is Stephen Gashler. I write fantasy and humor. Uh, my first book is called The Bent Sword. It's kind of a young adult Don Quixote. Um, uh, let's see, my second one is called Prisoner of the Mole People, kind of a, a quasi-horror spoof that takes place beneath Mount Tipinogus. Uh, the epic journey of a Mormon girl who is seduced by the evil king of the mole people who tries to force her to marry him. And um, let's see, what else? I also do music. Uh, last year at Latui here, we premiered my new album and concert. We did a concert called Valhalla, a Nordic rock opera. We'll just get all the self-promotion out there. So we're giving this away. I have a YouTube channel. Um, it's my last name, The, G the Gashlers. If you guys want to subscribe to it, we're going to post uh, a free download to everybody this weekend. So it's really cool. And uh, that's me. I'm Robert Starling. I've been in film and television production for about 45 years. And uh, I guess my, my claim to speculative fiction, fiction is I wrote my uh, uh, junior year in high school, I wrote my term paper on Robert Heinlein's Future History Series. And uh, that's good stuff. I've been in love with it ever since. So going back to the question. Uh, Latter-day Saints and science fiction, uh, is there a connection? Uh, that's better. So, uh, I kind of put the question here, uh, 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 a, a 
we just make stuff? Are we, are we too much healthy in these days. Yeah. Somebody may want to do what we do. It took me kind of years to figure out that wasn't a religious slur. Uh, up LS, LDS, <laughs> so the reason I wrote that is one time when I first uh, came back to my mission to BYU, I saw a Volkswagen in the back window. Somebody had taken the, you know, the little, we used to have little, little decals that had BYU and LDS. Someone had cut them up and repositioned them. There was a B-U-Y. Okay, so but the question of you know where we are as a culture, as a people, and as a faith with regards to uh, speculative fiction, it boils down to doctrine. Because while others wonder if there's life on other planets, we accept it as a matter of faith. And this is a quote, some quotes from Mr. President Joseph Fielding Smith. Justify that God, through His only begotten Son, is the Creator of this world and of worlds without number, oh, all of which are peopled by His Spirit children. Uh, and that by Him, through Him, and of Him, the worlds are and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters of God. And uh, there's one that I saw when I was doing research, and then I couldn't find it again, where it said that they look like us on other worlds. Uh, I don't know about the grays or whatever, but uh, they, they look like us because we're all in the So, interesting thought. So, when you see uh, uh, you know, Star Trek or whatever, all the, all the aliens oh, hey, are always Star Trek is almost right. You know, there's, there's a reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, the question is you know, if I could hide to Kolob, <laughs> and if I believe, Cobalt. can I get Cobalt. my own planet? And. Uh, video on that, you've probably seen it anywhere where it says, you know, I believe God has a plan for everybody and uh, he's a good me getting my own planet. Uh, somebody asked me, you know, as a woman, do I think I'm going to get my own planet? I said, nope, I'm going to build my own galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> I stop with one. Yeah, plants are small fry. <laughs> plants are small fry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now, uh, hey. uh, I, uh, God. <laughs> you want to read, Scott? Sure. The idea that there are rational explanations and that it's okay to explore those explanations is one of the reasons why the rigors of science fiction appeals to so many Mormons. For example, Mormons have a view that science is an explanation of the way God gets things done. So the sense of rationalism within the LDS theological construct brings the religious and the speculative science together. Very good. <laughs> Okay, so going back to the beginning, since this is the development, the first that I could find, maybe there's someone in this erudite panel here who probably knows a lot better than I do, but uh, the first thing I could find in terms of speculative fiction related to Mormonism was 1843. Harley P. Pratt wrote a uh, tract <laughs> pamphlet called The Angel of the Prairies, Dream of the Future. And in it, he, he wrote about a future society uh, where uh, the government of the United States had fallen uh, because of its own corruption, but there was this, this uh, theocratic society out in the West that was more of a utopian kind of thing. And uh, this is a, you can find this on, online, you can read the whole thing. I have not yet, but I will. But anyway, this is kind of the first, 1843. Hmm. And they, one of the things they said was that that he, Harley P. Pratt, actually read this to the Prophet Joseph Smith in one of the council meetings or whatever, and he really liked it. <laughs> Joseph Smith was a fan of science fiction. <laughs> well, by the way, while I'm thinking about it, did you know that the Mormon Battalion saw a UFO? No. You read the Daniel Tyler's, Daniel Tyler's, the Sergeant Daniel Tyler, the, his account of the Mormon Battalion trek on page 158 of one night as they were starting to make camp, they looked back to the east of the trail that they had traveled, and they saw this light in the sky that danced around for like 20 minutes or whatever. They all watched it and everything. So more of the time, saw a UFO. I had an ancestor in that. Okay, in 1888, Elroy Sniff Whitney, in response to the trashy dime novels that were infecting the youth of the church, uh, Elder Orson F. Whitney uh, suggested, called on LDS writer to produce our own fiction. Uh, they called it home literature. They wanted a pure and powerful literature, synonym on LDS themes, reflecting LDS values, a liter 
material that will assist in establishing Zion, not tearing it down. The, uh, I guess the uh, dime novels were the uh, video games of the day or whatever. <laughs> so, get this out of the way. Keeping in mind that a dime in 1888 yeah. was worth a little bit more than it is now, so. And then a year later, uh, uh, Nephi Anderson actually uh, yeah, and that's the famous one. Uh, responded to that call for uh, uplifting LDS literature with probably one of the most uh, uh, yeah, the first famous of the, uh, and it was it was a, a story about uh, people in the pre-existence earth and then afterwards, so it's a speculative yeah, fiction. It's speculative. It was a fictional story, that. so it was speculative fiction. Okay. And this added upon actually was in print from 1889 to 2005. And so it was a uh, very successful, uh, of course, you know, with this uh, everyday panel we have, they could easily pick it apart with this literature, but, but it. It, was, uh, it was very inspiring for a lot of people. I read it when I was a teenager. It's really hard to read. <laughs> Uh, B. H. Roberts then, in 1902, wrote *Corianton*, a Nephite story, which was uh, a book, and then it was made into a play, and then it was a movie. Uh, *Corianton* uh, was a film. If we had Scott Carson Scott Card here, he could tell you about it. It's his his great uncle. Uh, I can't remember his name offhand. Uh, actually, made in 1930 a uh, fictionalized Book of Mormon story about Corianton and his uh, dalliances with the harlot and all that sort of stuff. It was kind of racy for its time, but whatever. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, I had to get uh, this. The, it was interesting because I had talked to Scott about this a number of years ago, and he says, yeah, I saw it one time. It was 16 millimeter print of the film. It was in the box office. It's gone. It was an embarrassment to his family because his great uncle had to leave town because the investors were after him. They didn't make any money. And, but uh, he had seen it in a barn, somebody, one of his relatives' homes in Utah. And uh, I said, well, you know. And they, they, want, they wanted to bury it. He said, you know, it was an embarrassment to the family. I said, but Scott, it's. it's it's a part of our Mormon film history, you know. Yeah, you, we got to do something with this. And so, <clears throat> fortunately, uh, James Dark, who was the uh, curator of the media stuff at the Hermie Lee Library, uh, was able to find a donor. They put, together, they put several hundred thousand dollars into uh, restoring it and digitizing it and cleaning up stuff. And I got to see it at a screening in the uh, yeah. Carpenter Library. Were you there, Scott? I saw that as well, yeah. Yeah, they had a big uh, display of the uh, marketing memorabilia, movie posters, and stuff like that. But that was the first Book of Mormon film that I'm you know, aware of. But, anyway, it was, it was kind of cool. So, uh, let's see. I can't confuse with every Book of Mormon yeah. film since there's not one watch. <laughs> Okay, in the 40s, like the we had Raymond F. Jones, and a lot of you maybe know more about him. He was a quite a popular author of uh, uh, adventure magazines and stuff like that, science fiction stuff. Um, he uh, is listed here above Arthur C. Clarke on the, on the cover of his uh, uh, science fiction magazine. Anybody know what was his most, this planet Earth? This planet Earth. Earth. This, this island Earth. This island Earth. This island Earth. Yeah. Earth. Yeah. Yeah. And a yeah. little bit of trivia, when yeah. my next story comes out in Analog Magazine, I will become the second most published in Analog, yes, or Astounding, uh, beating out Orson Scott Card by a half story. This is one of his <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh, but, but I am never going to pass up Raymond F. Jones, who has 70. Yeah. 70 stories wow. in, in analog yeah. or astounding, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. I was trying to collect his short stories. Do now, I put Ray Bradbury in here. Uh, not simply play. because he's oh, one of my cool. favorite science fiction writers. I never got him finished. He, but he's I'm not LDS, thinking. but Please he do. had a really close association yeah. with some members of the church. Uh, when he was a teenager, his family moved, they were in Los Angeles, and they moved just uh, a block or two away from the old Wilshire Ward Chapel. I don't know how many of you know, it was sort of the center place in the church in, uh, in Los Angeles before they uh, built the temple or whatever. 
uh, it, it looks more like a Catholic cathedral than one of these chapels. They had a, a group there of young men, young women, uh, and mutual that wanted to do plays and, and roadshows and plus stuff like that. So they called themselves the Wilshire Ward Players. And somehow Ray Bradbury wandered in, and they had people like Lorraine Day, big movie star of the 40s, and the King Sisters, uh, big singing group at that time. Uh, well, um, Donna King Conklin was a friend of mine when I lived in LA. I, I was there for 13 years before I escaped. But uh, she, uh, and so Ray Bradbury, he became part of the group. He was one of the Wilshire Ward players. He wasn't a member of the church, but he just loved associating there. And uh, I'd heard that from Donna, and one time uh, I was listening to a radio station in LA, and Ray Bradbury was a guest. It was a call-in show. So I called in, and I says, Ray, I understand that you uh, had some uh, interaction with the Mormons when you were younger. And, and you know, it's almost like you could see through the radio his, his eyes lighting up and, and the warmth in his voice. And he said, yeah, all of my Mormon friends, it was, it was great, it was fabulous, you know. And uh, we had such wonderful times there. And uh, one of his stories that was another Mormon connection, uh, what's his name, Cummings, the, the guy that uh, did all the uh, Radio drama, radio style dramatizations of Ray Bradbury's he did radio dramas. Uh, he, he was a sound editor at the Motion Picture Studio here in Provo, and fabulous talent with sound. And he, he won some big giant award with PBS by dramatizing Ray Bradbury's stories. And one of the most one of the most interesting to me was a story that Ray Bradbury wrote. I can't, I can't remember the name of it. Get too old, but it was about. Is uh, space explorers that went from planet to planet, and everywhere they went, they, they thought, well, we're going to be a big deal because we're the first people from another world. So, so, so. And each planet that they went to, <laughs> it was like ho oh, hum, because there had been someone there just before them, and it was this uh, man who appeared and who wore a white robe and who healed people and did wonderful things for them. And so they were just kind of like ho hum after him, you know. <laughs> it's a great story. And then uh, Robert Heinlein uh, wrote a lot about Mormons and some a number of his stories. Uh, and uh, when I read Strange in a Strange Land, I felt like uh, maybe uh, that uh, the Michael Smith character was sort of an amalgam between Joseph Smith and Christ. Uh, and so read it and find out. Uh, um, Robert Heinlein uh, has one of my favorite references to, to Mormons in his novel Double Star, uh, which involves a, a, a character who goes on Mars and visits with the Martians. This was written back when we thought there still might be Martians. Might be Martians. Um, and he's invited to a, a special Martian uh, ceremony. Um, and then the, the, he, he says... I'm not going to tell you what happened during that ceremony uh, because it's too sacred. You wouldn't expect a Mormon friend to tell you what goes on in their temples, would you? Mm. you know, and I, I, I thought that showed that he must know some Mormons, you know, to, to, to know that. Mm. Heinlein yeah, loved nice. Mormons. He was a he was a fairly aggressive libertarian mindset, and he loved our can-do independent. He thought that culturally we were where America should go. He was a really interesting guy. Cool. All right. Uh, Samuel Taylor wrote The Absent Minded Professor and Son of Flubber. Uh, you guys probably know more about other stuff that he did, or whatever. No. Well, if, if you ever saw like the Robin Williams Flubber, this is the original of, movie of yeah. that. So it's kind of odd to watch. <laughs> um, but, I mean, honestly, the Robin Williams version is funnier, but if you want some interesting old movie, this is a, a funny place to go. One of the interesting things about Samuel Taylor is that he also wrote a book called uh, Heaven Can Wait, um, where basically he explored his own increasing ambivalence to the culture. He loved the religion, but he was becoming bothered by the culture. And uh, that, unfortunately, was kind of his thank you, goodbye, thanks for all the fish moment. Hmm. Um, and he kind of moved away from the church at that point. But that's really worth reading because it, it, like Levi Peterson's The Backslider, it shows that in his heart he was so connected 
that he could never lose that, but he was struggling with some things that, that he was never able to get answers to at the time. Well, and it's something that we struggle with now, the, um, the tension between what we're taught in the gospel and the culture that we live as members of the church. There's, there's a lot of tension going on there, and it does drive people away. And if we're at all worried about you know, how we're treating our fellow church members in the present, we need to be conscious of this and looking at the past and how it happened to other people can help. And, and have you heard the last 25 years in Salt Lake area, the Los Angeles Club, but have you been born and raised in Georgia for 13 years in California? I've got kind of a different perspective than most of the people, what we call Utah Mormons. Mm-hmm. The Utah Mormon culture is, is certainly something different from the church. And if you've uh, spent you know, like any significant amount of time off outside the Wasatch Front. Okay, uh, again, going back to Heinlein, it was interesting to me, maybe you guys have some insights on this, but in the in Starship Troopers in the movie, they had this, this thing where uh, there, were, there were Mormons at the, at the beginning of it talking mm, about, yeah. but and so I went back to the book to check again, and it's not in the book. Nothing mm-hmm. about Mormons in the book. But in the movie, they had this thing where uh, they said Mormons, they, they were warning people about the arachnid uh, you know, insect uh, creatures. It says, however, Mormon extremists disregarded the federal warnings and established Port Joe Smith deep inside the arachnid. <laughs> wow. yeah. Clearly <laughs> written by a non-Mormon. Yeah. <laughs> Who here has ever talked about Joe Smith. <laughs> so whoever wrote that part of the script was not as familiar with Mormons as Heinlein himself was. <laughs> I think it's great. And, and, so the, and so it always asked the golden question, would you like to know more? <laughs> with uh, bunches of scattered bodies. So you how see, were the Mormons was, like, wiped out by the yeah. bugs? Yeah. Let's just say the Expanse treats Mormons way better. <laughs> uh, we've got... Uh, development uh, of speculative fiction. Of course, one of the big stars is Stephanie Myers, maybe many of the books and all that. And I know that I'm going to be amazing a lot of black and all of a lot of really great people here. I apologize, but I finished this at 2.30 this morning, and so I, I didn't I start to fall asleep. Scott Carpenter's game and his whole, and, and I love the Alvin Maker series, which is sort of an alternative universe, Joseph Smith kind of thing. Well, can we stop and talk about some of this for a That's second right. here? Because, I mean, one of the one of the funnest Joseph things Smith. about right, about reading LDS authors is seeing all of the Mormon Easter eggs that they throw throughout their books. Even in Ender's Game, like, wow, you can tell if you're a member of the church that his mother, Ender's mom, is a Mormon. And if you're not, you might not quite pick up on that. But that's throughout all of those books, these little things. He has ideas about intelligences in in, um, uh, Xenocide and Children of the Mind that are straight out of Abraham 3. And when you're looking at his... um, uh, Earth series, uh, the ships of Earth, Earthfall, and Earthborn are seen on the slides. There, that is a retelling of the first of the first few books of the Book of Mormon in space. They are leaving a colony planet to try and come back to Earth, and the main character's name is Nephi. Yeah. That is on purpose. Okay, he has three older Nephi? brothers. Nephi. I have Who's to that? admit that I was, you know, well into the novel before I finally it finally <laughs> to, to me. Uh, you know, familiar, it wasn't right? until uh, until Nephi's father is talking about uh, two of his sons and saying, you know, I wish you could be like this this mountain and you could be like this river. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> And he does the same thing with the Alvin Maker series. It's the story of Joseph Smith. And it was the weirdest thing in the world in high school to have a Catholic friend of mine saying, you really need to read these books and telling me the plot. And I'm going, wait a minute. (laughs) You don't know what this is, do you? I've read the original. (laughs) Well, getting back to Children of the Mind, right? There is one of the most compelling descriptions of the Tree of Life in there. That, uh, that deepened my testimony, frankly, as a, as a church member, because I read that, saw that perspective, saw it from a slightly different angle, and it brought me that much more new light and knowledge because I had thought of it from a different angle. Um, powerful stuff. Yeah. So yeah, read, read card. <laughs> it's just good. <laughs> Any other comments here on this slide? <clears throat> we just okay. like to get to the panel. Yeah. Okay, and, and some of the newer... Folks out there, Richard Pollard with Michael Bay, I'm sure. Yeah. What was that? 
He is. He's he's had some challenges, some struggles, but he he's been in and out, <laughs> and in again, I think. And many, many more. Again, I apologize to those that I've left out. You to uh, one of the most recent uh, developments is the expanse, and uh, and uh, Eric needs to show you his shirt there. Yeah. <laughs> So what I loved about the expanse. For those that are in the back. Yeah. Mormons paid to build the Nauvoo, and all we got was this lousy T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> what I loved about the expanse was that it was obviously not done by Mormons. It wasn't done to try and promote the church, and but it was done respectfully. I really loved that as I was looking at these Mormon characters, you know, the random missionary who shows up, the people who are trying to build this interplanet, this interstellar ship, that I could look at that and say, yeah, this is exactly what we would do in this future. We are totally going to do this. Can you explain in 30 seconds for them what it's, what it's all about? So, the, so in the Expanse, the Nauvoo is this ship that the, that the Mormon church is building with the express idea of they are going to pack it full of their most faithful people and send it to another star to colonize another star system. In the Expanse, we only have the technology to go through our solar system. This would be the first interstellar spaceship with actual humans on board. Kind of like Brigham Young taking the sanction to the Rocky Mountain. This is exactly what we would do. And I love that about I love that you had a missionary, and I love that they were just a part of the world, and that it was handled respectfully without it being overriding everything else that was going on. It was a wonderful little flavor, and it was done so right. And I love that about the show. That being said, I also appreciate it when it's done wrong, you know, because you look at Starship Troopers, and you're like, oh, great, there's a, a Mormon colony being eaten by spiders. Like, we're still the bane of people's jokes. That makes me think we're doing something right. If we stop being the bane of people's jokes, you know, we're probably not putting ourselves out there enough. <laughs> to borrow from Roger Stone, if they ever stop talking about us. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, hey, even even though you can handle it respectfully, in the books, um, Leviathan Wakes that has this same part, They um, the Mormons are very upset when at one point the main characters try to hijack the Nauvoo. And the way that they get the Mormons calmed down is they tear gas them, except for it's marijuana gas. And so they get all of the Mormons <laughs> high. And that's their riot control. And I thought that was just so wonderfully fitting that I, I just loved it. It was great. I, I, I on the other this hand, is the wrote, angel Moroni here. Mm -hmm. so I can't fire. tell in the public oh. place. I wrote, I, wrote, I wrote a bit of fan fiction with an alternate scene uh, uh, in which uh, rather than gassing the Mormons, and, uh, come on, just talk to the leader and say, look, this asteroid threatens all life on Earth. The Nauvoo is the only thing big enough to, to, right. to push it out of the way. And Mormons are rational enough people that we would say, yeah, you can use our ship to push the asteroid. And we have a strong enough top-down hierarchy that, look, if you can convince a guy at the top who says, you know what, I believe this is the right thing for us to do, and everyone will say, yeah, okay, let's go do it. Let's do it better than... He can. So I was disappointed with the treatment in the book. I thought the, the treatment in the movie was, uh, in, the, in the show was, was better. Hmm, cool. Okay, so uh, let's see. I guess the next question that uh, the panel can look at is, okay, what's next then? What, what sort of trends are we looking at? Well, the one thing that I did forget, to, that I didn't have time to redo it, is uh, Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. And uh, I, I say that because it's one of the most overt uh, and, and I happen to know Newt Glenn Larson, who created Battlestar Galactica, and uh, uh, he uh, actually, we, we started a, a, a fellowship of LDS media professionals in Los Angeles in 1977 called uh, the Associated Latter-day Media Artists, or ALMA for short. And Glenn was on a board of directors, and, we, and our, in, in our first meeting we talked about as Latter-day Saint artists, having been given talents and abilities by God, what responsibility may we have to use them to serve His purposes, not just our own? And so uh, He, I think, took that to heart. And I don't know if Battlestar Galactica was really. Um, he did say something later to me that indicated that maybe it was sort of a seed that uh, that brought that about. Well, one one thing we haven't talked about yet that I want to make sure we bring up is Brandon Sanderson. Um, not only do you get all of the wonderful Mormon Easter eggs 
in all of his books. But Brandon is doing what I think is one of the most ambitious and frankly amazing pieces of art in in literature today it's his cosmere mm. the whole connected universe of all of his different um adult novels and i'll be talking about that on friday at two on a panel but i just wanted to plug it today that this is the literary equivalent of the marvel cinematic universe and it is just as cool it's just in print and i don't know if anybody well, for now. And I don't know of anybody that is one person, and yes, he has assistants, and yes, he keeps a wiki to keep everything straight, but one person who has dreamed up a universe that expansive. And it really talks to me about how, you know, building new worlds and building new universes is something that we as members of the church believe that one day we will be able to do as we become more like God. That's part of our theology, like we talked about in the beginning. And Brandon Sanderson is doing that in intellectually right now right on earth and that to me is one of the coolest things that i have seen in literature in my whole life um, we only have 10 minutes left so we might want to open it up for yeah, some I questions just, i just want to get, to, you know, top that off with you know as i as, as i was listening to talk about how he's keeping all the steps for and everything it was almost as though I uh, think, uh, think they told you uh, uh, what that meant. Uh, Joseph Smith was basically translating the Book of Mormons, creating the, man, right, the, man. Uh, the same kind of thing, only it wasn't in space. Oh it was a great presentation. And to be able to keep all of the stuff straight and all that kind of stuff, it was going to be half the five minutes an hour to do all this. I think you got the last slide here. Oh, yeah. So, we'll turn on the lights and then we can ask you questions. That's okay, we'll get there. Yeah. It's me. It's the By the way, this is a Jewish uh, yeah. symbol. Mm -hmm. Is it? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? It's it's a it's a blessing that the rabbis would give at the end of the, at the end of services. They'd go like that. Uh -huh. if, yeah. I'm just curious. Where it is yeah, that's that's where. Through the Nimoy got it from. Novel. How was it received outside of Mormon circles? I'm just curious. Um, well, I know the whole great thing is um, the uh, basically there are. I've had a lot of people who are not Mormon, but who felt it was a really good story. But they tended to be religious people who are tired of religion being treated poorly in science fiction. Sorry. No worries. Um, and uh, you know, and then there, it, the story had its detractors. Um, I think if they had not changed the nebula rules a couple of years earlier uh, to move to a just whichever story gets the most votes, uh, rather than a preferential ballot with ranked voting, uh, I think that I would have uh, would not have won the nebula award. But uh, there were seven nominated works, and uh, mine was you know, managed to get at least 15% or so, you know, and if everyone else was kind of evenly Morality. split, that would, that would be enough to, to win. So I, um, you know, I, I've, I've seen, I've seen the story, uh, you know, cited as an example of, you know, how religion can be used in science fiction. And in fact, there's a, a Jewish, uh, group, uh, near Baltimore, that discusses science fiction, and uh, they actually uh, discussed the story. And one of my friends was there and said it was a really cool discussion. So, more questions, please. This is what we're here for. First of all, does anybody on the panel have something you're burning to to say? I do. Yeah. So I, I thought about this question of like, why would it be that uh, members of the church? have interesting things to say. Uh, why, why is there a natural tend towards speculative fiction? And I, I kind of traced back the history and I thought about, you know, like the, the Christian tradition has always been very entrenched in storytelling. You know, because you go back a few centuries and virtually everyone was illiterate. And so one of the modern theories, I was at a panel at BYU uh, a few weeks ago, and they're, they're throwing out this idea that the book of Mark, believed to be the oldest gospel, was actually intended to be a play. It was intended to be read out loud and performed, just like many of the, the Catholic cycle plays, and this is how you would transmit knowledge orally when most people couldn't read, and this is how you presented the Bible. And you know, you, you come into the Middle Ages, you have the, the clergy who's just terrified of giving this information to the public. 
Because if everybody could read the Bible, you'd have no end to interpretations, you'd have factions, you'd have war and genocide, and they were exactly right. You know, then you get somebody like William Tyndale who fundamentally disagrees. He translates the Bible, he distributes it to everybody. He says, I'm going to educate the plowboy. He's going to know more than the Pope about the Bible. Well, then you jump forward centuries. Joseph Smith is the fulfillment of that prophecy, right? He is the embodiment of the plowboy who comes to know much more than the Pope. And Joseph Smith, I think, is like the ultimate uh, kind of speculative thinker, right? He brings forth what is presented as a thousand years of history of ancient American peoples. There's world building, there's geography, there's prophets and kings and priests and all sorts of these epic stories. And you present this world to people. He talks about gods and goddesses and worlds without number inhabited by people and that there's no end to time and space and there's no end to consciousness and there's no end to human potential. And that's going to have an impact. And right? yet the Book of Mormon ends with all of the good people dying. <laughs> <laughs> so it just creates this culture, I think, For in now. the LDS Church of people who are just totally speculating, thinking about life on other worlds and life after death and, you know, saying we're going to go into the wilderness, we're going to build this utopian society. You're bringing in 10,000 people from throughout the world who are forsaking everything, selling their stuff to go into a barren wilderness where people want to kill them, where it's actually legalized by the government to kill them. That takes a rare breed of people. And you compound that with this new emerging doctrine that is endless and so science fiction oriented. You know, God is actually a dude who lives on a planet. He's not some cast that fills space. Like, boom, mind blown. So, yeah. Yeah. A question. Um, Practically, where modern science science fiction is headed, um, it's kind of trending. I'm just curious, how does that, how do you feel that, where do you feel the more mainstream science fiction fantasy genre is trending? How does that contrast or compare with where we're trending? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't think there is a trend, honestly. I think I think right now that we are wide open and doing a lot of things. Uh, I, for example, have never written a non-Mormon story. I published 50 short stories, 50 plus short stories, and, and a couple of novels. Um, but not a one of them names anything explicitly Mormon. I write thematically Mormon stuff. But a lot of people don't consider that Mormon fiction because it doesn't have explicitly Mormon elements in it. Um, and that's a conversation I've had, you know, with the Association for Mormon Letters and others uh, who want to focus on explicitly Mormon stuff, whereas I want to focus on thematically Mormon stuff. Uh, then you have stuff like Eric's, which is a little bit of both, right? It's directly characters who are who they are, who do what they do for reasons that are specific to their culture and their religion but also set in space with Whalians and, and uh, everything else, right? There's a lot, of, there, uh, there's just so many different directions to go and there are so many different viewpoints as to how you can do it. I don't think there is a trend. If there is one trend, I would wager a guess that you're going to see more diversity within um, Mormon speculative fiction authors, just as the church is becoming more diverse and more worldwide yeah. mm -hmm. and encompassing more people of different cultures, not just Americans. I think you're going to see a lot more of that diversity make its way into both fiction by members of the church and fiction about members of the church. And I think one of the reasons that you've got, you know, successful things like Book of Mormon musical and, and so many other things that are not written by people who are not Latter-day Saints we sometimes kind of put ourselves down or don't realize, you know, the the the, uh, the power that we have. I mean, we're the we're the uh, we're the we're the fourth largest uh, church in, in America right now, and uh, in California, the Latter Day Saints is the second largest Christian church in, in <laughs> California, and, and we we sometimes don't think that we have a story to tell or that other people are interested, but we do. We also secretly control Pixar Animation Studios. <laughs> don't believe it and watch Coco. <laughs> just saying, if you go to BYU, I've never seen more. I'm sorry, if you go to Disneyland, I've never yeah. seen more BYU hats and jackets. I think there's a yeah. there's a big sway there, actually. Well, you know, and, and there's, uh, I think there's an interesting point here, which is I think you are going to see more explicitly Mormon characters or explicitly Mormon situations in mainstream science fiction and fantasy, because I think as, as as artists, we're becoming a little bit more mature and less self conscious about it. <laughs> Uh, and B, there is a cultural shift right now that actually likes cultural studies 
And there's opportunities if people are willing to take them. And I think there's a lot of people who will. Now, I think there's going to be a lot of argument in the church as to whether that's good Mormon SF or whether that's bad Mormon mm -hmm. SF. But that's okay. As long as the conversation's happening, we're winning. <laughs> awesome. As long as they spell our name right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we talked about the, uh, the, the recent um, name preferences. And uh, even, even in this panel, we're talking about Mormon specifically uh, I understand it as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in your heart. Um, can you talk, I mean, I, I don't even know the answer to this, but can you talk a little bit about other schismatic groups and how they've been represented in speculative fiction? And this will have to be the last question because we've got we to get in. So, you, you mean, are you more uh, yeah. LDS schismatic groups like yeah, other, other Strangites and Community of Christ and stuff like mm -hmm. that? Um, mm -hmm. I'm really not aware of any in speculative fiction. I I, I know in mystery there's uh, there's at least a few novels with a detective who's a member of the community of Christ. Or else, yes. um, what's what's hard about a lot of the schism groups is that they are so much smaller, and in any group of any sort, you need a certain critical mass of people before you have you know enough artists or people who are willing to devote themselves to any art form that you really have ones that rise to the surface and become really good and become really good household names in general. This is all generalization, but I mean, you have how many millions of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and you have a relative handful, more than maybe we ought to have with proportion, but of Brandon Sanderson's and Stephanie Myers and people like that who are really famous. If you're looking at an FLDS group that is a couple hundred people, the odds of them having a really good artist, certainly it could happen, but they're much fewer just because there's not the critical mass of human beings and there's not a cultural tradition necessarily of having that stuff going on. It could certainly happen. If those groups grow bigger, if the community of Christ gets, you know, makes a whole ton of converts, then, hey, they might just be able to have that as well. At the moment, like Eric said, I d am not aware of anything that is going on, but it certainly could happen. And even uh, writing a spe some speculative fiction about that happening might be really interesting. <laughs> and taking just a slightly tangential view to, what, uh, to the question, I think a lot of what you have is those who are willing to, to be overt in their, in their Mormon elements or in their... In their Latter-day Saint-ish elements are are all operating under kind of a you know Scott's Private Heresy number sixteen model that there's that that the sense that the community is now somewhat transcending the church in fiction is going to blur a lot of those lines. People are not going to necessarily see the schismatics as a specific separation, but they will resonate to some of the some of the spiritual or doctrinal elements that underlie the story. And I think that's where we're going to see a little bit more of that kind of thing. Less a, a slice of literature than a flavor that kind of permeates. We're certainly getting known on Sister Wives, right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, folks, live long and prosper. Thank you so much. And uh, come say hello and get some bookmarks. Yep. It's important, by the way, if you want to do the Jewish thing, make sure that thumb comes out. Don't do this. <laughs> the thumb comes out. Mm -hmm.